<coughs> Gosh, that's loud. Um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, on behalf of Exercise Sport Science in Aspatar, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, and the Scientific Planning Committee for thinking of sports science in Aspatar and inviting, uh, unfortunately, me to present to you all today. So I hope I can make a good job of it. Um, this, I would like to think, is an interactive session. Um, if you look on the, 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 the screen at the moment, there are some simple instructions to follow. Um, and essentially, based on your responses, I will guide my talk for the next 20 or 25 minutes on the needs of the audience. Um, there is also a bit at the end for my colleagues also in the overflow room who don't seem to be getting the opportunity to ask any questions. Um, also, you can type a question for me to answer at the end. Um, and in which way we'll be able to get through quite a lot in a short period of time. Uh, there will be prompts on certain slides with the numbers 54, 79, 70, just in case you forget as we go along. So, um, without further ado, is this going to work? No, it's not. Okay. Uh, inshallah. Japs, is there any reason why this isn't working? It started so well. Yeah, so just press. Oh, I just use the mouse, do I? Ah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. So here we go. Um, standard issue. Um, you will see a couple of things to do with supplements on this slide. Um, and obviously we are using a little bit of software to help the interactivity of the session, but I have no uh, association with any of those. Um, I've, given the thought, I've given the session some thought today around about what I think might be interesting to listen to. Um, and we've also looked at the feedback from the previous Oral Health Symposium as well to try and help guide our objectives. So these are the objectives which you have already seen. And I'm going to take this opportunity today to base my session around this piece of work which, which I'm actively involved in on the oral kind of health scene, if you like. And most recently we've drafted, uh, myself and my colleagues um, have drafted a consensus statement on sports nutrition and oral health. Um, and this is basically back in May, this is the first sort of publication uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine to start to bring this to, uh, to everyone's attention. There are certain things today that I'm not going to pretend that sports nutrition can help. This being one of them, uh, an unfortunate lady uh, who got smashed in the face in the Olympics in 2012 that I had to work with uh, thereafter. But it does bring a very relevant point when we start to think about teeth, oral health, um, and this paradox, which is people you know, do activity to be healthy, but actually when you play high performance sport, it creates this thing called a burden, or, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a great thing. So I've listed a couple of those examples, and at the bottom I've asked the question about the mouth, the oral microbiome. And that's the bit that I'm going to pick up on throughout the rest of this session. Um, oops, hello. That's better. Um, for those of you who are wondering if sports nutrition can have a positive impact, these are the evidence-based areas that clearly show that sports nutrition does have an impact on health and or performance. Um, I can provide you lists of references um, after if you wish, um, but the references at the end of the session you will see are the references that are put on the rest of these slides. So, does sports nutrition impact on oral health? So this might be a time to see if we can get this bit of technology to, to work, to see what some of you actually, to see if you come across athletes um, in your practice. So let's see if we can do this. Okay. So that's not showing up. Okay. So I have some stats in front of me to show that half of you, half of you in the audience, there's, a, there's uh, over 60 of you that have um, replied according to this. Over half of you see a lot of athletes in your practice. Um, 
less than half of you don't know what uh, sports nutrition is, and oh, that's shifting already. Um, and half of you think that sports nutrition is a big problem for teeth. So that's quite interesting. So I'm going to just try and change um, my tact a little bit on my talk to to kind of start to reflect that. Okay. Good place to start. What does the evidence su suggest? Well, you know, my colleagues here in Aspitar recently have reported on sort of the situation in the Middle East. Um, uh, Ashley Knight and, and Dr. Mohammed themselves in 2018. And, 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 and the overall picture is that, yes, you know, oral health is poor in athletes. Some papers, for example, there's a group in London, the Needleman Group, who are pretty prolific in, in looking at this in athletes, have, have also started to look at the associations between things like sports drinks um, and oral health in athletes as well. Um, but really, the evidence is actually quite limited and unclear in those sorts of associations. So we have to be careful how we look at sports nutrition when we think of teeth in our athletes. So, when we start to think about a mechanism as to how this occurs, I mean, this is basically what you see with a traditional elite athlete. And the key point there is they are doing something to do with their mouth, eating or drinking wise, 8,000 times a year. Okay, so that's a lot. So when we start to think about the actual mechanisms, it's no surprise to us that obviously if you're using something more than the general population, your possibility of something going wrong is going to be increased. But then you've also got these other things that are going on possibly with athletes as well. And I won't read through the list, but um, I'll pick on a couple. So for example, um, when people sweat, you know, and, and when they train for long periods of time, they get dehydrated, which can affect the salivary flow, which we know can affect um, oral health. And we also know, for example, that number five, we have products in the market these days that are acidic, caffeinated drinks, which are consumed a lot, not only by athletes, but the general population as well. So when you take all of these factors into consideration, there is no doubt a clear rationale as to why sports nutrition could be thought to have a negative effect on oral health. But the evidence is not, is not really there. It's not strong enough at the moment to say, yes, it definitely does. So the second question, not only does it impact on oral health, but does it impact on their sports performance? Because this is an underlying argument at the moment um, in the general literature theme. And, and if, you look, if you think of um, performance, performance to me as a practitioner is literally the statement that you see there. So while there are no studies that have directly shown um, there's a, a, an actual cause effect, if you like, there could be an indirect effect by pain, um, people being uncomfortable, not eating enough, so they're not eating enough energy, um, trips to the dentist, days away from training. So all of these things could indirectly affect an athlete's performance. So the answer to that is possibly. But is this just an athlete problem? <coughs> And when you look at the real world these days, you know, athletes aren't the only people in the world who eat. Um, when you look at the diets these days and the way that food and industry have impacted on, on the foods that are available, today we have pretty much sugar in everything that you eat, okay, whether that's natural or, or added. So, you know, when we talk about sugar and oral health, we have to also think that this is in all of our lives, not just an athlete's lives. We also have things to think about, for example, like how we and our kids are affected by athletes endorsing products with high sugar contents in. That's a real life situation. Um, there's also new markets emerging, and this is what this picture is trying to show you. You know, um, industry tagging onto words like protein and putting them into big sort of sugar, more sugar containing bars than normal non-protein versions. Okay, so, so I don't really think that things to do with sports nutrition products are just to do with athletes. I think, I think we have to be careful with the audience, and perhaps we've got this a little bit wrong. And to prove this, I think what I'm going to do now very quickly for a couple of slides is go over my rationale for this, my proof. Okay, 
So when people think of sports nutrition, I think it's key to, to really think that not all sports and even positions in those sports are the same. And they all have different requirements. And the point I make there is with the arrow. Okay, how many people do you see going to a gym, not really working that hard with a, with a, with a bottle of sugary solution, uh, you know, and drinking that as if they're running a marathon? Okay, how many people? We've all seen it, and it's modern practice, okay? You know, so, so this, this slide is trying to, Im you know, is, is identify for you, well, who needs what and how much? And really, unless you're a high-performing athlete, or even if you're a serious recreational athlete doing really high-intensity training, you do have to wonder if you need any sort of sugar and carbohydrates in your exercise at all. So we have to be careful. We don't generalize things, because it's not true. We also have to have a mentality that not all kids are athletes. How many kids do you see walking around with these, these sugar solutions? You know, um, you know we, we have a big problem with this, with, with our service and the support we provide at the moment in some areas. Um, it's, it's very clear, and this is from the Sports Dietitians Australia position statement, that there are a group of people who perhaps these things are appropriate for, for the amount of training that they do at that age. But kids who go to evolution football and play football for an hour three times a week, that's not that population. We also have to be very careful that not all carbohydrates are the same. All the studies that have been done have looked at sports drinks and sugar and maltodextrin. And even those two things kind of aren't really the same. So we need to be careful that what messages we're sending out. You know, it's not that all carbohydrates are bad. It's just the horrible added ones that you get in certain products are really not very good. It's not that the rice and the lentils and the pasta are not good for you. So we have to be careful with that. For those of you who haven't really worked with athletes as such in, in so much depth, you know, athletes don't eat the same all the time. So it's not an accumulative effect of eating the same way for years and years and years. Um, you know, sports nutrition and performance nutrition, you use certain things at certain times to reflect the amount of training that you have to recover or support. Not all athletes train as hard as they do all year long, and that means they eat differently. So we need to be careful <coughs> with that. A lot is made in the literature about supplements. Fact, seven, over 70% of elite athletes take supplements. We're not going to get away from that. It's a part of elite life. It's their choice, they do it. Okay. So underneath that, it's also important to know that not all supplements contain sugar. And I've just identified a couple in bold of the ones that do. What's more of a challenge now is the way certain things are used. And I'm going to pick up on a couple of examples to draw your attention to what I mean. Um, so these are certain strategies now that are used in sports nutrition, which do have potentially an impact on oral health. So this is not the actual type of the product, but perhaps type, you know, it's also how it's used. And I'll give you an example, two examples. In the recent Russia World Cup, you probably would have seen a lot of this. What's new? Well, you always know what an athlete's drinking by the colour of the tape around the top of the bottle. So this one's got a y little yellow tape around it. And the way that athletes know which bottles have got carbohydrate in and which bottles haven't is because the support staff just put coloured tape around it so they can identify which one it is. So this is a technique called swill and spit in carbohydrates. And it's been shown in some evidence to support improvements in performance, whereby athletes wouldn't actually swallow the drink. They would take the drink in their mouth, gargle it for a period of time around their mouth, and then spit it out. That's a problem. You know, before with mouth guards, it used to be the fact that they spray their drinks in their mouth guard, they put their mouth guard back in, and then their teeth were surrounded by the mouth guard. That's not so much the problem anymore. The problem is moved on. Okay. So you can imagine carbohydrate solution in a dried mouth with reduced salivary flow. That's not overly fantastic. The second thing to point out is that there are now products for sports nutrition that are used to improve performance, which not only have quite a lot of sugar in per shot, but actually 
promote bad messages to suggest that you shouldn't use other things to promote good oral health because it impacts with the way that these things actually might work. And this is an example with beetroot juice where some of the common belief is that people should avoid using mouthwashes um, or cleaning their teeth when they use it. And that's actually incorrect. So again, we've got something that's coming from uh, you know, a little bit of evidence that's being Chinese whispered and blown up here to something which is completely incorrect, which is indirectly affecting oral health of our athletes. So what can we do about it? A couple of solutions. One, um, from my experience, the athletes, athletes will always potentially have problems with oral health because they always have to have carbohydrates in their diet. Okay. At some time, they always have to use certain products to increase or improve their energy or recovery. Um, and as such, they need to make sure that they've got healthy teeth and get them checked regularly. So the first thing is to use the team behind the team and get the network set up with the dentists in, the sit in, in situ so that those athletes can get seen um, at least once, twice a year to get screened, number one. Number two, we have to be aware of when there may be other additional demands that might require a bit more education and a little bit of a campaign. Um, it's not just about when people use products, but perhaps more relevant for our region as well um, is perhaps certain times of year like Ramadan. Um, you know, we have to perhaps use those periods of time as an opportunity to push those good oral health messages as well. Um, the one of the third solutions is perhaps how big sporting bodies, you know, help promote the positive messages. It costs money to do campaigns to try and change the way that kids eat and drink. Um, and it can't only be down to the local organisations in the specific countries to do that. There needs to be some higher level of support to, 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 to try and promote these positive messages. And alongside that, I think what we need is to, is to use modern methods of communications to get people's attention. So on, on, on the far left, you've got uh, a simple infographic to do with off-season, which one of my colleagues actually designed, um, a, a nutritionist. Um, and that's a clear example of some, taking something that's quite technical and horrible into something which is practical and real life for the boys to look at and, and use. But we've also got other technology that we can actually spread good messages with. But I think it comes down to identifying the audience that we need to actually affect as well. I think too much attention is spent on the wrong audience and not enough on the younger right audience. And I think Dr. Mohammed's studies would have sh shown that to you um, earlier, earlier on. And finally, Another example is what we call, we're using the business end to promote good messages. So this is a, on the right, this is, a, this is a booklet that we did for our Qatari athletes um, together with Dr. <laughs> Juan Alonso. Um, and, and in there is a simple map that we put for sports nutrition to, uh, to promote positive messages around the Olympic Village. And one of them actually included making sure that they brush their teeth and they use their mouthwashes regularly across the course of the day. Um, so, so by using that to push those positive messages, I think overall we start to get a behaviour change that could make you know, the oral health um, better for, for our athletes. So I guess to kind of conclude, these would be my take-home messages. Um, and you would have read in the initial um, learning objectives, I made a reference to food science, solutions with food science. I honestly don't think this is a scientific thing with athletes. This is a pure fact that athletes just need to brush their teeth and look after their teeth. Okay. Um, and on that note, um, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. So some questions from the floor. And we'll start with you. <laughs> this is really interesting, this slide. I wish, Jeps, can I get this slide up? Is that possible? Because I need to show this. It's really good. This is the, um, this is the Mentimeter slide. It's not showing for some reason on the uh, 
It might be because the presentation view is on the... Um, that's great. You had it then. You had it. Will it come up now? Um, okay, it's not working. Why isn't it working? You carry on. I'll answer questions okay. as we go. Please, first question. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, very informative about um, an area which we probably don't, as clinicians, know a lot about. Um, I, don't, I hope you don't mind me asking, but your example from the World Cup, for example, when you're saying the, the process of swishing this highly sugarated liquid, I mean, I'm sure at the end of the day, to my mind, the athlete is doing that like, for one second, three times maximum per 45 minutes. How detrimental could that be to the oral health? So it's a good question, and I'll give you a simple answer, because I know the nutritionists who are working with that particular team. Um, there was a big education campaign to do with how much, how much time you've actually got to keep that solution in your mouth before they spit it out, and it's actually much more than one second. Um, what they're also told is you should actually try and get the other bottle with no tape around it and swill it out with water afterwards. But, you know, again, as you just alluded to, the time for these breaks is very, very short. And, you know, lots of rules are in different sports governing breaks in play for those things. And rugby is another example um, where you've got the added problem with mouth guards as well. Um, so, so it is a problem. There is no research to show the impact of just doing that, obviously, on a field of play, on oral health. But I bring, bring you back to my other point. Perhaps it's just not one thing, but it's an accumulation of a lot of things that are not done properly that, that's the issue here. You can't just focus just on that. It's the, the, the whole athlete environment over the course of the training leading up to the event that's the problem. just wanted to clarify, uh, I wish I could get this. So um, a lot of you replied to this, just, just for your own reference, um, and for some reason it's not uh, showing me, but I just went on to the system, and all of the audience who voted, which was 37 people on this particular slide, all thought that 20 grams of sugar had, were four teaspoons or six teaspoons, and it's actually five. Only one person got it right. Good man. You've heard me before. Oh, okay. I'm picky, picky. Yeah. Do you want me to go through some of these questions quickly? Yeah? Okay, if I just quickly go through some of these questions that have popped up. Um, there was one there that said, couldn't you use sweetener in drinks instead of sugar? Well, the reason why sports drinks are sports drink is because they've got sugar in for energy. <laughs> Sweetener doesn't give you energy. Um, nutrition behavior and teeth health. I don't know who asked that question, but um, you know, nutrition behavior and teeth health is something that we really look on with our young athletes in Aspire Academy. And we've really tried to start to focus on that a lot more over the last couple of years. Um, but we know with any kids age 13, I've got two kids, one, one 17 and one uh, 13 year old, changing their habits is a nightmare. <laughs> So, you know, if everyone else's kids are like that, it's a really difficult thing. Um, how does the preservative agent have impact on your teeth? I've got no clue, to be honest with you. Um, what are the biggest obstacles to good nutrition for athletes that you see? Um, simply just um, getting mixed messages off different people, getting bad messages off the internet. I think, you know, if people just did the simple things very well all the time, they could improve. You know, it's not just the glistening pill or the quick way of doing things that gets the results. It's doing the hard yards on the things that aren't very nice, like hard training and eating well, not taking lots of supplements and um, trying to cheat not training. Um, what else have we got here? I noticed a very poor oral hygiene levels in young athletes. Um, do you have an e explanation? Um, I think there's a, you know, 
having only been here for five years, I put the word culture in because I'm comparing the words, I'm comparing the culture here to the back in the UK, for example, and other places across the globe that I've worked or consulted in. And I think I think everyone's got their own view on education and awareness, and they started at different times of the athlete career. And I think that's probably my biggest thing is my observation is when those things are started in a, in a young athlete's career. For example, it's the Youth Olympic Games at the moment. You, you probably see that on the internet. And, and I know there's a big campaign in the village around about oral health in, um, in, in, the, in the Olympic Village for that age, which I think is fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you.